Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Brian Amkraut, the Executive Director of the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program titled the 2016 Elections with our guest scholar, Professor Robert Watson. Before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker, I want to recognize and thank a few people who've made tonight's event possible. Uh, almost four years ago, getting pretty close to the exact date, uh, we created the Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve, and we are pleased with how we have grown the program over that time, and I want to recognize Laura and Alvin Siegel, who are with us tonight, for their vision in moving this experiment forward. So, uh, thank you. And I also want to recognize another individual whose really tireless work helped us achieve so many of these goals. Uh, Terry Klein was the board chair at Siegel College who guided the process leading to the incorporation of our program into Case Western Reserve. Uh, Terry and Stuart Klein have continued to be great advocates for our program. We thank them for all they do and specifically for sponsoring Professor Watson's visit to Cleveland. So thank you, Terry and Stuart. So uh, I do want to take um, a few moments to point out some upcoming programs we are running uh, here at Siegel. Um, our upcoming courses, our summer program, uh, really begins right about now. Uh, and uh, this includes a class with Leatrice Rubinsky on Rescued Words of Young People of the Holocaust, uh, an American Jewish fiction class, Authors of Today with Reva Leisman, uh, and uh, really a, a new experimental program we're excited about, Hot Issues in Jewish America. This will be a, a panel discussion program between myself and uh, Alana Cooper, the director of our Jewish uh, Lifelong Learning. Uh, and the way we plan on running this is every time we run one of these sessions, we're going to have a guest panelist uh, from the community and we're pleased that that will be Rabbi Andy Kastner, uh, and that is this Tuesday, um, um, this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, our Jewish Lives book discussion series, which we began last summer, uh, picks up again this summer, uh, and a flyer for that is in the back. Uh, so now I'm going to get on to introducing our speaker. And I mentioned that four years ago uh, we began this program, and it's just about four years ago that we first welcomed Robert Watson uh, here to Cleveland, and we're so pleased to have him back. Uh, Professor Watson received his bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech, his PhD from Florida Atlantic University. He is a professor, author, media commentator, and community activist who joined the faculty of Lynn University in 2007 after spending 15 years teaching at other universities around the country. He has published more than 40 books, hundreds of scholarly articles, book chapters, encyclope encyclopedia, reference essays, uh, and has co-convened a half dozen national conferences on the American presidency. Uh, he's moderated political debates and forums, delivered more than 1,000 keynote addresses, town hall programs, and lectures to civic, professional, and community groups. His work in the community also includes founding three nonprofit think tanks dedicated to civic education, political reform, and fact-checking campaign lies. Maybe he'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, it's a good, good season, good season for Robert. Um, and um, you know, in addition to everything uh, that that he does uh, academically and for the public in South Florida, uh, he is really a, a great. Um, uh, advocate for uh, and resource to the lifelong learning community, not just in South Florida, but I know he travels around the country, uh, and you know he he will probably tell you this as well. Uh, but I know he shares with me uh, the sensibility uh, that he learns a lot, but that um, you know there's no better group of students than the lifelong learning community. Uh, he has been interviewed thousands of times by local, national, and international television, radio, print, and online outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, Time. Magazine, USA Today, The New York Times, BBC, and others. He's appeared, uh, appeared on C-SPAN's Book TV, Hardball with Chris Matthews, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. You've got to send me the clip on that. Uh, CNN's Inside Politics with Judy Woodruff, Fox's Special Report with Britt Hume, and more. He is also the editor of SUNY Press's popular book series on the American Presidents, and both edits and directs the multi-volume, multi-edition encyclopedia, American Presidents and American First Ladies for Salem Press, Gray House Publishing. He actually has another page, but I'm going to stop here uh, and let him get up on the stage. Please join me in welcoming Robert Watts. Uh, Brian, thank you. Uh, it's good to see Brian again. He's a great host. Mr. and Mrs. Siegel, thank you again for the opportunity. The Seagulls used to come to my lectures in Florida uh, for years. Everyone at Case 
at the Siegel program here. Thank you for all that you've done and for having me back. And um, I'm happy to also say I know half the audience. <laughs> wow, how about that, Brian? Have you ever had a guest who knows as many people as you do <laughs> in the audience? Uh, so Cleveland, uh, it's good to be here. And by the way, I'm not just saying this, you can ask my family. This year I've been pulling for the Cavs. I have. <laughs> I've followed all the games, been pulling. If Love has a good series, this series and next series, they're gonna win it. I think that's the key. LeBron will get his points, Kyrie will get his points. Love has to have two good series. But, uh, so I'm rooting for the Cavs. All right, um, so uh, tomorrow we have a program at noon. I'm gonna talk about a brand new book of mine that just came out, which is over there. So uh, if you don't know, we'll have another program at noon tomorrow. Just to give you a quick overview, um, in the final moments of the Holocaust and World War II, there occurred an unimaginable tragedy when thousands and thousands and thousands of folks from the concentration camps were killed. And the Allies and the British government were so shocked, so appalled that they sealed the records. The records were sealed to be sealed until the year 2045, making it a 100-year secret. Uh, happily, the records have been declassified and uh, it allows me to tell the story of uh, one of the horrific unknown tragedies of the war and the Holocaust, uh, maybe the last tragedy of World War II. So that's what we'll talk about tomorrow, okay? My topic tonight is, I don't know if anyone knows, but there's a presidential campaign. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, okay, two, three, all right. <laughs> Uh, so I'm supposed to make some sense out of this. And I also am going to talk a little bit about uh, Hillary and Trump's positions on issues relevant to, related to Israel. Uh, so we'll end up with that. Let me just start by saying this is one for the history books. And you all know that. We have had some crazy elections in American history. Uh, one of my books is about this. There have been some absolute jaw-dropping moments in campaign history. In the year 1800, for instance, we had a fascinating race. Uh, it was Thomas Jefferson against John Adams. Talk about a clash of the titans. Quality candidates like today. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it, was, it was an important election because it was the first election without George Washington at the helm. He had died on December 14, 1799, just right before the election. Uh, it was the first campaign with political parties. Jefferson and Adams had been very close friends. Jefferson had been Adams' vice president, but when Jefferson challenged Adams, that ended the friendship for years. So a fascinating race. As it turns out, Jefferson beats Adams, but Jefferson and his vice president tied. His vice presidential nominee was Aaron Burr, one of the most bizarre characters in political history. It was a 73-73 tie in the Electoral College. Uh, so they had to have, not where I'm from in South Florida, a recount, <laughs> but they had a re-vote. And they re-voted the entire re election, and it was a tie. So they had another re-vote, and it was a tie, and another, and another, and another, and a tie, and a tie. Get this. Over the course of weeks, weeks, they had 35 tied ballots. They could not break the tie. Um, and at the point where once you get so no one wanted to break it because that person would be a political outcast, right? Half the country would hate you. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's lifelong enemy was Alexander Hamilton. Ironically enough, it was Hamilton that broke the tie. Even though he couldn't stand Jefferson, he announced that at least Jefferson, unlike Burr, stands for something and is sane. <laughs> of course, the Burr-Hamilton feud would not end so well, would it? Uh, so that was a crazy election. In 1824, we had another barn burner. You had John Quincy Adams, a son of a president running to be president. Could you imagine such a thing? Uh, Harvard-educated, diplomat, and traveled all around the world. He was uh, challenged by Andrew Jackson, who was orphaned as a kid, 
slept with prostitutes, fought duels, a man of the frontier. Talk about an interesting choice, right? Uh, Jackson beats John Quincy handedly in the popular vote, uh, which of course is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, every four years. Uh, Jackson goes back to Tennessee, thinks he's the president. The Electoral College meets. The Electoral College meets after the election. The Electoral College meets, and I can't make this stuff up, on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December. <laughs> on the way over here, Brian and I were talking about the need to reform our system, right? Um, and the Electoral College flips it and gives it to John Quincy. Uh, it's known as the corrupt bargain. Uh, Jackson and John Quincy Adams were outraged at one another. Uh, Jackson would not call John Quincy Adams his excellency, which is what we used to call the president. He called him his fraudulency. Uh, just a remarkable race. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln never should have been the Republican nominee and never should have won it. Lincoln won the nomination for the following reasons. One, he had home court advantage. The Republican convention, uh, and you guys know a little bit about home court advantage with conventions. The Republican convention was in Chicago, the way it's in the Cleveland now this summer. Uh, and what Lincoln's supporters did was they lied and cheated. What they did was back then conventions were really conventions. Today, they're pretty much four-day-long infomercials with a red, white, and blue balloon drop at the end. Back then, they were conventions. People would meet, and you had no idea who the nominee was going to be. And after a day of two of haggling, you would produce the nominee. Then they would willy-nilly just pick a VP on the spot and then fight for their party platform. So uh, people went to Chicago having no idea. What Lincoln supporters did was they stole the tickets of the Bates, Chase, and Seward supporters so they couldn't get into the convention. Then they printed fake tickets for the Lincoln supporters. <laughs> they also literally strong-armed the Bates, Chase, and Seward supporters to the back rows up in the nosebleed seats to make sure their supporters, the Lincoln supporters, were front and center so that when they cheered, it gave the impression that Lincoln was the most popular one there. Then Lincoln played Bates, Chase, and Seward off one another. As is often the case with great men, Bates, Chase, and Seward could not stand one another. You know, there's only a new room enough for one chief, right? So Lincoln goes to Bates and says, then he writes about this so we know exactly what he did. He says to Bates, I know that you cannot stand Chase and Seward. I'm with you. They would be a disaster. So if we can't get you, would you at least consider me as your backup? And Bates said yes. Then Lincoln went to Seward and said, look, you and me, we can't stand Bates and Chase. And if I can't get you, would you at least consider, get the point? He played the three of them off one another. Uh, the three of them basically checkmated one another, and Lincoln emerged as the dark horse. Then in a general election, if it was a two-way race with Judge Douglas, Lincoln would have lost. But it was a four-way race with Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, Northern Republicans, Southern Democrats. And with 30-some percent of the vote, Lincoln becomes president. Thank God, right? So just crazy elections. But I really think that this election cycle is rewriting the history books. Think about it. A year ago, two years ago, no one thought that anyone could stop Jeb Bush. In the first three months that his campaign was up and running, he raised almost $110 million in three months. This put him on par, on track, that he was not going to just beat the records set by Clinton, W, and Obama, and all three great fundraisers. Jeb was going to shatter every record. Jeb already had a campaign organization up and running in all 50 states. His brother put it together. His father put it together. His grandfather, Prescott, put it together. My line was always a Bush could raise a billion dollars to run for president just on their holiday card mailing list, right? <laughs> Who would have thunk it that Jeb wouldn't have uh, emerged? You had 17 Republicans running. 
in one of the crowdest and arguably the craziest uh, field of candidates in history, Ben Carson, right? Uh, Rick Perry, who didn't know why he was running, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, Rick Santorum, who said the Earth is 4,000 years old, he doesn't believe in evolution, and just a crazy field. Everyone thought Jeb or your homegrown, Mr. Kasich, would stand out and would easily be the president and vice presidential pick. And a Jeb Kasich ticket would have been a very good ticket for the Republican Party. Because we all know, number one, the way to win a presidential campaign is to be a moderate, at least up until now. Number two, we all know that the two most important states for being president, my home state of Florida and your home state of Ohio. And with Jeb Kasich, theoretically, they could have taken Florida and Ohio, which means Hillary would have had to win Pennsylvania had to sweep, sweep every other swing state and pick up a state here or there. And you know and I know that among the red states, I can't think of a single red state that Hillary could turn blue, although I couldn't think of a single blue state that a Republican could turn red. So with Jeb and Kasich, that might have been the ball game, right? But it didn't happen. Uh, Donald Trump happened, right? Um, this was clearly the year of the anti-establishment candidate candidate. In many ways, people always say, when are we going to get a third party run? I've been saying we've had two of them. What is Bernie and Trump? If not, I mean, they've run third party campaigns, haven't they? It just so happens there's an R and a D after their name, names on the ballot, but they've run third party campaigns. One of my textbooks is on campaigns and elections, and I readily admit it is now obsolete. They need to take it out of libraries and put it in a museum. Um, my line with all my friends and colleagues around the country that write books on politics and the presidency is we've got a, we, we need a new edition. You know, for example, everything we said, you've got to run to the middle. No, you don't. Uh, you've got to seek political party support. No, you don't. Not anymore, right? Uh, you've got to raise a lot of money in the conventional way. No. You've got to run 30-second ads. No. Everything we've said is now thrown out, out the window. Um, you know, we said that if you say something racist, you've got to do immediate damage control, and it may not allow you to recover. Well, guess what? You can say something racist every day, uh, and it doesn't matter. If you say something sexist, then something homophobic, then something crazy. And then if you say you could shoot someone in broad daylight, <laughs> Your numbers go up. Uh, so this year is unlike any other year uh, in history. Let me give you an example. Um, you all watch the Sunday morning news shows, meet the press, whatever. Um, the Sunday morning news shows all have an exclusivity clause. That is this. If Hillary or if Jeb is on one of the Sunday morning shows, CBS, they can't then run across the street and tape ABC. If they're going to give you this prime slot for several minutes on CBS, you've got to just do CBS that Sunday. And you have to sign the exclusivity. You can't run and do Fox and an ABC and then. Um, I'm an, the analyst for our NBC station in South Florida, and I do a Sunday morning show. We've done it for years. And even us, a little old affiliate in South Florida, we have an exclusivity clause. I have an exclusivity agreement. I can't do local ABC and CBS in Florida. And if we have someone on our a state senator or our governor on our Sunday morning show, they cannot go on CBS. Every single candidate of the 17 Republicans, five Dems, every single, and every member of the Senate, every diplomat, everyone has to sign an exclusivity clause except one. Trump never had to. He's allowed to go on every one of the shows. Secondly, there's a non-compete clause in that if Hillary's on this Sunday, we can't have her next Sunday and the next Sunday. You have to have Bernie on, and then you have to have Kasich on, then you have to have Cruz on, then Rubio. You have to split it up. But Trump can go on every single Sunday. In fact, he can call in from his toilet. <laughs> and they would interrupt prime programming and put him on. 
No one else can. If, if uh, Hillary or Bernie or Jeb or Kasich called in, they would say, hell no. You can't go on. And if they were on this Sunday, none of them would be allowed on next Sunday. But Trump's allowed on every week. Why? He has made the media too much money. Newspapers have been going out of business. As you know, today, probably over the last 12 years, we've lost a third of the newspapers in this country. And those that are still around, their numbers have plummeted. They can't find a way to make online profitable. They haven't been able to develop a profitability model. Uh, network political news has been diving for years, right? Uh, enter Donald Trump. Everything is up. Ratings are up. Uh, in my, the Sunday morning show I do uh, in Florida, um, every time we focus on Trump, our numbers go up. If we don't focus on Trump, after the first three or four or five minutes of the show, people click to the other channel because they know someone's going to talk about Trump. You talk about Trump, your numbers go up. Uh, we don't talk about Trump, numbers are down. Um, we decided to move the uh, general manager of the station told me that we were moving our show from 30 minutes to an hour. Were we doing it, A, because our anchor is so good? No. B, I have anything to say? Certainly not. C, the public is clamoring for more political news? No. D, because we might talk about Trump? Uh, yes. <laughs> we're moving to an hour. You know why? We cannot spend in a 30-minute show all the advertising money that politicos and campaigns are throwing at us. Think about a typical 30-minute news show, local. You've got five minutes for sports, because you need to hear the local high school girls' volleyball game score. You got four or five minutes for weather, because you need to, everybody's fixated on the weather, right? And I don't know why they give the weather in South Florida. I can save you that it's going to be hot and it might rain for the next 50 years, right? It's, the weather's always the same. It's hot and it might rain. Um, and then we even do weather teasers every four minutes, don't we? Um, you take out the commercial time. You know, you only have so many minutes of news, but we can run maybe eight or nine minutes of commercials in a 30-minute show. If you run an hour, you can use that whole bottom of the hour, right? That whole bottom of the half hour, a couple minutes before the 30-minute spot, a couple minutes after. We, we can double plus the amount of commercials we run, and everybody wants to pay ads because they know we're going to talk about Trump, and therefore everyone tunes in. So uh, here's my stock tip. Invest in your local, especially Ohio, with the convention in a swing state. Invest in your local news show as long as Trump's running. Then sell your stock after the election because everything's going to plummet, right? Uh, so there's my stock tip for the day. So everything we said to be true is no longer true. Uh, every way we said to run about a campaign is no longer So forget it. All the analysts have been completely wrong, right, everybody? Well, not only is this fascinating, a Clinton-Trump, imagine the three presidential debates. It's, you know, it's like Godzilla versus the creature from the Black Lagoon, right? It's going, to be like, it's going to be better than ultimate wrestling. It'll be like the Super Bowl, <laughs> right? People are going to be, the ads are going to be special ads. Uh, weeks before the debates, that's all you're going to hear about, right? This is a clash of the titans. This is great. It's Shakespearean. It's great theater, right? So um, what a race. Now, if it, is it, as if that's not enough, the backdrop for this election is fascinating, too. Both the Democratic and Republican parties are being torn apart from within. In some ways, Hillary's biggest headache is not Trump, it's Bernie and her own base. And in many ways, for the last year, Trump's biggest headache has been the Republican National Committee. Uh, for the last year, my line to the media has been the Republicans are behaving like Democrats. For years, here's what we have. The conventions are four days long. And one of the main reasons for having a convention is they draft the platform. Should we be pro-choice or pro-life, for or against gun control, spend money on stem cell or not, whatever. So you put your platform together. For the last several presidential elections, uh, the Republicans have their platform done by day three. It's a very consensual, homogenous, organized approach. The Democrats, on the other hand, 
What's the Will Rogers line? He used to say, quote unquote, I'm not a member of any organized party. I'm a Democrat, right? <laughs> the Democrats would leave their convention and still not have their platform drafted. Uh, this year, it's the opposite. Uh, the Republican Party has a full-on civil war for the heart and soul of the party. I think what happens this year will determine where the Republican Party is going to be for the next several years. Think about it. You have a libertarian wing, sort of the Rand Paul wing, no government exerting itself. You have the evangelical wing, which is ridiculously strong. The Rubio, Huckabee, Carson, Cruz, evangelical wing exerting itself. You have the hawkish wing, the Lindsey Graham, John McCain, hawkish. Lindsey Graham was on my flight up, by the way. Um, so uh, a hawkish wing of the party. You have the corporate wing, which used to, Kasich, Jeb, which used to be the most powerful, but now it's the least powerful. And of course, the, the group within the party that has taken the party over is the Tea Party wing, Donald Trump. Now, can you imagine your convention in July with all these groups sitting around? It's going to be fascinating. People were saying that Cleveland was going to be the uh, zombie apocalypse, right? <laughs> it's going to be rioting, and there's, I don't think there's going to be any rioting. I just think the fights on the floor are going to be fascinating because I don't see the evangelicals giving any ground. I don't see the Tea Party giving any ground. I don't see the liber right? It's going to be really interesting. Um, moreover, Donald Trump's personal style is not one that lends itself to compromise and finding the 50-yard line. The other powerful Republican players are Rand Paul, uh, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, all of whom are enormously unpopular. You all do know that Ted Cruz is the single most unpopular member of Congress in years. Every Republican in the Senate not only dislikes him, they loathe him, right? Something happened last fall that, to, to, don't worry, Democrats, you're going to get yours soon, so <laughs> sit tight. Um, last fall, something happened that, uh, as best as I could tell, has not happened since the Civil War, and that is this. The Senate is very collegial. Senators address themselves in such a formal, pleasant way. Uh, you know, Senator Amkraut, the distinguished colleague who's as clean on the inside as he is on the outside, why he neither looks up to the rich nor down to the poor, why he is a gentleman and a friend. You know, 10 minutes later, then you ask the question. So the Senate's been very collegial. To get along, go along. Last fall, Ted Cruz was booed off the stage by the Republicans. Get this, three times. It hasn't been since the Civil War where we've had someone booed or in the Senate. Three times by his own party. That just doesn't happen. The second most unpopular member of the Congress is Marco Rubio. And they're going to be the second and third most influential people at the convention. I don't know how they're going to compromise. It's going to be interesting. So everybody said there were going to be riots at the Republican convention. No, but it's going to be fascinating and dysfunctional. I figure I'll get at least two books out of this one, right? <laughs> Where I think there could be rioting is the Democratic convention. The Democrats have been looking down their nose at the Republican process. Now it's the Democrats who are dysfunctional, right? Or the Democrats, as I've taken to calling them. Bernie supporters will not go quietly into the night. They will not behave. Think about it this way. Eight years ago, the establishment and older Democrats were backing Hillary. The young new voters were backing Obama. Obama won. So the young voters came in and voted for him and helped him to win the presidency. The establishment older voters didn't get their purse in Hillary, but their establishment Democrats, so they held their nose and voted for Obama. This time, it's the opposite. The establishment are going to get their person, Hillary. The young folks, Bernie, are not going to get their person. Are they going to come out in November? Of course not. No. So that's going to hurt the Democrats in a big way. So I actually think what's going to happen at the Democratic convention could shape the Democratic Party over the next several years. So this is the backdrop for this fantastic comedy slash tragedy that we have. Here's the other backdrop 
the Senate. The House will stay in Republican hands by a comfortable majority. Pigs will fly before the Senate the House changes uh, to Democrats. Um, but the Senate, another matter. Uh, in 2014, the Democrats got shellacked, Obama's term, in the Senate race, right? And Republicans took over the Senate. The Democrats were defending twice as many seats as the Republicans, including a lot of swing vulnerable seats, and they got whooped. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. What comes around goes around. Guess what's happening this fall? The Republicans are defending twice as many seats, including vulnerable and swing seats. All your major analysts are predicting the Democrats will pick up between three and eight seats in the Senate. They need five to get even and six to take it. So it's going to be a flip of the coin. Um, if you follow uh, Nate Silver, for example, I think he's one of the best in the business. Charlie Cook, Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia, Congressional Quarterly, all these prognosticators that are always spot on are saying it's going to be a 50-50 whether the Dems take over the Senate. With Trump as the Republican nominee, that could help the Dems to take the Senate. If Hillary were to pick Julian or Julian Castro, uh, the young member of the Obama cabinet, Latino, as her VP, the Dems should take over the Senate. Because with him on the ticket, hundreds of thousands of Latino voters will participate, and that will trickle down through all races. Um, the other factor that could help the Democrats to win the Senate is the open seat on the Supreme Court. Of course, the Senate is very important right now for many reasons. One is uh, foreign policy and treaties. The president will initiate the treaty, but the Senate has to ratify it, right, everyone? Can anyone name a time that's more precarious in foreign policy than today? Yemen, Syria, North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Russia, climate change. Uh, you know, we could be here for two hours, right, just naming all the things. Um, and the Republicans have been ferocious in not even allowing Obama to have a vote on some of his treaties or make appointments. So there's so much foreign policy business, the Republicans for the last seven and a half years have not even allowed to come to a vote. So there's a lot pending, and it's a, it's a, a full plate. So that's important. The Supreme Court is important. And right now the high court's 4-4 with the passing of Justice Scalia, it's 4-4. It was 5-4 conservative, a 4-4. And whether you're Democrat or Republican, you're interested. Because the Supreme Court is one vote away from a sea change in several very vital socioeconomic issues that define who we are. A woman's right to an abortion. The separation of church and state. Affirmative action and civil rights. National Security, Gitmo, Espionage, the Patriot Act, uh, uh, public funding of contraception, insurance plans. All this is 4-4 right now. One vote. And especially if a, a young justice is selected, it could change. So Obama may have checkmated the Republicans by picking Merrick Garland. Irrespective of where you are, politically you would all agree that Merrick Garland is incredibly well qualified. In fact, I would say he's one of the best selections in the history of the country for the high court. If you go to law school from USC to Harvard, they teach Garland's writings and opinions. Garland was, Garland was the chief justice of the second most important court. He's a centrist, a moderate. He is responsible. He is a brilliant legal mind. And on top of everything else, he's a nice guy. It's a perfect pick. Why did Obama checkmate the Republicans? Not only is he the perfect pick, but the Republicans announced day one. In fact, before they sent flowers to the Scalia family, they announced they would never even hold a hearing no matter who was picked. Well, the country is upset that we're all playing politics with the country. We're all playing politics with the Congress, but now we're going to gridlock the court? That's going to blow back. It's going to blow back. So not having a hearing on someone like Merrick Garland will be problematic. 
as we move into the fall and the Republicans, because of the way the process works, have to start beating up Garland, that's going to blow back. Uh, one of the other objectives the Republicans have had for this election cycle, the Democrats have dominated the Jewish vote. Obama took 78% uh, of the Jewish vote in 08 and about 70% in 12. The Republicans feel they can chip away this time around. Merrick Garland's Jewish. And as they start pummeling him in the fall, that could blow back. By the way, the court is made up of Jews and Catholics. How about that? Not a single Episcopalian or Presbyterian. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, right? The times, they're a-changing, right? So um, what the Republicans may find is if Hillary wins the presidency and the Dems take over the Senate, now they're in a pickle because she can pick anyone she wants. So the Rep Mitch McConnell will likely call the Senate into an emergency session after Thanksgiving and quick confirm Garland because he's a centrist, he's a moderate. Uh, and everybody likes the guy. So that's the backdrop for this. Now, I think that there's some advantages for Mr. Trump, and I think there's some advantages for Ms. Clinton. Um, let me start with uh, Clinton. Uh, disadvantages and advantages. Um, the biggest advantage the Democrats have going into November, demographics. Demographics. Uh, after the 2008 race, uh, at midnight, I remember on the stations I was doing commentary for, at midnight they said, all right, Robert, what's your takeaway from the 08 election? And I said, demographics and mathematics. The Republicans must diversify their party if they want to win in 12. At midnight in 2012, I was asked, what's your takeaway, Robert? And I said, demographics and mathematics. The Republicans must diversify the party if they want to win in 16. Why? The country's changing, everyone. Um, Obama and the Democrats won every major demographic group but one in 2008 and in 12. Get this. They not only won every major demographic group but one, they won all of them by double digits. Obama won the black vote by double digits, 95%. He won the Latino vote by double digits, 72%. He won the Asian vote by double digits, the Jewish vote by double digits, the gay vote by double digits, the youth vote by double digits, the labor vote by double digits, the environmental vote by double digits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only demographic the Republicans won comfortably, old white guys. Now I see... <laughs> Three, three in the audience. Maybe four, I don't know, I, the, the, the light's in my eyes. I see a few old white guys out there. To the old white guys in the audience, I'm not picking on you, Mr. Okay? Because something incredible has happened in the last four years since I joined you. I've become an old white guy. These are new, right? This is getting gray. I have a new friend. Something that my wife is really concerned. I've started driving slower. I never pull over and ask for directions. My butt's getting smaller and my gut's getting bigger. I need one of the old white guys afterwards to explain to me why that works. Does it continue? Okay, you know, there's less here and more here. Here, here, and you don't want to know where else, right? So I become an old white guy. Now here's the thing, old white guys. There's simply not enough old white guys outside of this audience in South Florida to win a nationwide election. The Republicans must diversify the vote. Agreed? Of course, it's a no-brainer. Um, now, the problem is this. Arguably, the two most important demographic groups to win in 2016, I would say the second most important demographic group the Latino vote. Why? It is the fastest growing community in the country. The Latino vote is going gangbusters. It's the population's growing very fast. It's not if, but when Latinos will be a majority of the country down the road. Mathematically, it's, inev it's an inevitability. Now, Republicans are getting shellacked 
in a Latino vote. It's much bigger today than it was in 12, and it's much bigger then than it was in 08. The Republicans need to do a good job in the Latino vote. Here's the problem. Three observations. Observation number one, you cannot oppose immigration reform and win the Latino vote. The Republicans have defeated immigration reform for the last seven years under Obama. I'm just saying. Number two, you cannot oppose the Dreamer Act and win the Latino vote. The Republicans have defeated the Dreamer for the last seven years. This is if you're two years old from Guatemala and your mother or father brings you here. This is the only country you know. You know the language. You're now in college. As long as you know the language, you're employed, in school, not run afoul of the law, we're not going to deport you. The Republicans have not only opposed but defeated for seven years both of those. Here's the biggest problem. You cannot say racist things about Latinos and win the Latino vote. <laughs> Enter Donald Trump. <laughs> now, Mr. Kasich never said racist things about Latinos. Jeb Bush never did. Jeb Bush married a Latina. Jeb Bush, for years, tried to work to bring Latinos into the Republican fold. His children are bicultural. He speaks Spanish. But Trump says racist things about Latinos every day of the week. How are the Republicans going to do well with the Latino vote if he's on top of the ticket? Big concern. The most important demographic group for being president in 2016, the women's vote. Women are now the majority of voters. Okay, you can applaud, ladies. There we go. <laughs> Women are now the majority of voters. And um, here's the problem. Number one, you cannot win the women's vote if you're pro-life. I'm not saying pro-life, pro-choice is right or wrong. I, in fact, I don't want to talk about it. Statistically, public opinion polling, if you're pro-life, you're not going to win the women's vote. Republicans are pro-life. Women are the majority of voters. Do the math. Number two, if you're against abortion in the case of rape or the mother's life is in danger, you're not going to win the women's vote. Huckabee, Rubio, Cruz, Carson were all against abortion, even in the case of rape or the woman's life. How are you going to win the women's vote? Most importantly, we know this. You cannot win the women's vote if you say sexist things about women. Enter Donald Trump. <laughs> Mr. Kasich never said sexist things about women. Jeb didn't. Santorum didn't. Rubio didn't. You know, once upon a time, Bob Dole didn't. Ike didn't. Jerry Ford didn't. Olympia Snow didn't. John Warner didn't. Dick Luger didn't. All those Republicans didn't, but Trump does every day. How are you going to win the women's vote? Trump said that women over 40 are, quote, unquote, fat and ugly. How are you going to win? Now, none of the ladies in here are upset because you have another two or three years to go before you get to 40. <laughs> so in another two or three years, you're going to be pissed. You're going to be pissed. But for now, you're good. How do you win? Uh, Trump picked a Twitter war with Heidi Klum, the supermodel. Y'all remember this? You know who Heidi Klum is, right? The supermodel? He said now that she's 40, she's no longer hot. And she's no longer a 10. Ha, ha, ha. We all know that Trump's a 10. <laughs> I always say it's, it's Bradley Cooper with better abs and better hair, right? Um, so Trump made fun of her saying she's not a 10. How do you win the women's vote? I remember this comment well. I do the analysis, for example, of the American desk for public radio in Ireland, uh, ABC in Australia, and a couple other outlets, blah, 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 blah. And I was doing a radio show in Europe, and it was the day Trump started making fun of Heidi Klum. And I remember it well, because it kind of went viral, and I got inundated with email. It took me about two months to get caught up on my email. Because they asked me on, live on the radio, they said, what do you think about Trump saying she's no longer a 10? And they were, you know, lobbing a softball to me. And I, I go, I agree with him. <laughs> She's an 11. That was my comment. Okay. Psh, right? Uh, but who does this? How do you win the women's vote? Trump made fun of Hillary and women for going to the bathroom. He said it's disgusting when women pee. 
I have news for Trump. <laughs> Women pee, okay? Maybe Melania doesn't pee, but other <laughs> women pee. He made fun of Megyn Kelly for a menstrual cycle, remember that? I have news. This happens. How do you win the women's vote? This is a big, big challenge for Trump. Uh, Trump is clearly being told to pick a woman for VP. There are several out there. Ex-Republican moderate senator, respected stateswoman, Olympia Snow. Unfortunately, she said she can't stand him and would never do it. Uh, uh, Nikki Haley from South Carolina. Young, ethnic, moderate, tough, smart. Although she said she can't stand him, no. Susanna Martinez from uh, New Mexico. Latina, uh, sharp, smart, moderate. Although she said she can't stand him, no. So who are we left with? Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. I don't know. I don't know who we picked. I don't know who we... Maybe Kim Kardashian. I don't know. Just saying. So Trump clearly needs to look at a woman because of that issue. Uh, that issue. Um, the other problem for the Republican Party is the whole notion of compromise at the convention. I just don't know how they're going to work that out. The Democrats have their problems, too. Most obvious, turnout. At all the Republican primaries and caucuses, or caucai, <laughs> can, uh, turnout was at record levels, wasn't it, everyone? Um, Kansas, Kentucky, a number of states ran out of ballots, couldn't fit everyone in the rooms. The, the, the counting of votes took too long because the turnout was so vigorous, so robust. When Hillary does a rally, tumbleweeds roll by. Right? It's three people sleeping. She doesn't get crowds. Um, Hillary is not getting crowds. Trump is bringing out record crowds. Do the math. Turnout, turnout, turnout. So that's a big problem for the Dems. Here's the, the Dems. I always say that presidential elections, unlike Senate, you know, city council, dog catcher, whatever, they're popularity contests. It's a lot like homecoming queen or prom king. Y'all remember about 15 years ago when you were all prom kings or homecoming queens? <laughs> 16 years, 17. Um, it's a big popularity contest, isn't it? Um, the presidency's the same way. Uh, it's personality, not policy, when we vote for president. It's personality on parade. This year, you might say personality trumps policy. And what a perfect example. We have probably more than any other candidate in history someone who knows nothing about policy, but the cult of charisma and personality, he's larger than life, versus someone that no one likes but knows policy better than maybe anybody who's run. So we have this perfect contrast, right? Personality, Trump's, pun intended, uh, policy, right? Um, think about it this way. Um, it's a call to personality. Republicans in the audience. If Ronald Reagan was still alive and could run, you know you'd vote for him. And you don't care about Iran-Contra. If you don't know where Reagan is, was on interest rates, you don't care. You loved him. People loved Reagan, and they'd vote for him. Democrats in the audience. If Bill Clinton could run again, you know you would, right? <laughs> Pun intended. You'd vote for him. Never mind Lewinsky Gate. And if you didn't know where he was on interest rates, you don't care. You love Bill, you'd vote for him again. Uh, think of it this way. There were a lot of Democrats in 2000 that did not vote for Al Gore. They simply voted against W. But not as many people were motivated to come out to vote against someone as to vote for someone. Because in presidential politics, it's about personality, which Al Gore had none, right? It's about, we don't vote with this. People always think we're this rational voter. No, we're not. There's people without health care. Their kids don't have health care, but they are furious that government's trying to allow them to get health care. That doesn't make any sense. Democrats and Republicans are irrational voters in the presidency. We don't vote with this, we vote here. 
we vote here. It's in the gut. It's in the heart. It's about, it's, it's, it's emotional. It's about making a visceral connection. Who could make an emotional, profound, visceral connection with Al Gore? Answer, no one. Not even Tipper, right? <laughs> um, so, for example, I'm a big Harry Truman guy. He's my favorite president. Yes, Truman made mistakes, botched the steel strike, underestimated Stalin at the beginning. But I find myself, if I'm in the basement of the Truman Library doing research, my knee-jerk gut is, that's okay, Harry, you rocked. <laughs> you pushed civil rights, you know, the bomb was the right thing to do, established Israel, blah, 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 you know. Whereas I was never a W or a Carter fan, so I find myself sometimes, if I'm writing, I have to really watch this. If W or Carter made a mistake, I'm ready to hammer them because they're not here with me or they're not here with me, right? Hillary does not make connections with people. For whatever the reason, people just do not like her. You've seen the phenomenon in polling lately. Bernie supporters, Democrats, they go, oh, I'm a Democrat. I've, you know, we need to raise the minimum wage. We need stem cell research. I want to protect the environment. I don't want to invade Yemen. But I'm voting for Trump because I don't like Hillary. It's a popularity contest. Hillary's been in public, the public eye for 24 years. So it's hard to rebrand her. It's hard to, for a do-over, a makeover. Uh, she's simply not popular. You've seen this in the last couple of weeks. What is the Clinton campaign doing? How many times in the last couple of days have you heard her talking about being a mother and a grandmother? All the time. She's, tr she's doing something new, taking a page out of Trump's book, and that is to try something completely undone. She's trying to out dull Trump. She's trying to be safe and dull, dull, dull. Figuring that a lot of people equate Trump with chaos. Therefore, Hillary is the safe, dull alternative. What a bizarre race we have on our hands. Ultimately, it'll come down to maybe six states. The two most important ones, Florida and Ohio, of course, in that order. Florida has 29 electoral votes. Ohio, what, 20? Um, we know how 40-some of the states are going to vote now. We knew how they were going to vote eight years ago for this year. I'm going to predict how 40-some of the states are going to vote in 2020. We know that Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, Vermont, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maryland, Delaware, D.C., they're all voting Democratic, of course. And it doesn't matter who the nominee is. It doesn't matter at all. It could be Donald Duck against Daisy Duck, which... <laughs> Although it'd be the Donald Duck, not Donald Duck, it'd be the Donald Duck, because you have to call him the. Um, on the other hand, we know that the following states are all voting Republican, no matter what. Texas and Alaska, North and South Dakota, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Georgia, South Carolina, Kentucky and West Virginia, they're all voting Republican. It'll come down to a handful of states. There are three states I want you to keep an eye on west of the Mississippi. They're neither red nor blue, they're purple. They're 50-50. They tend to be bellwether states. These three states are right down the middle. They are in importance Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. Colorado, excuse me, Nevada, if you're from there, uh, and New Mexico. Colorado has nine votes, and the Nevada and New Mexico have five each. So that's 19 votes. That's not a lot. But if this is 50-50, which I think it's going to be, that matters. Keep an eye on those three states. They're voting. Now, right now, most of the analysts are saying advantage Hillary. Why? Obama won Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico in 08 and in 12. He swept them. He went three for three in both elections. So the Democrats are trending. Secondly, what's the Latino community doing in those three states? Growing like crazy. Advantage Hillary. 
The three big states that matter, of course, Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, with 21, I believe, electoral votes. Um, those three big states, you add those up, it's 70, 70 electoral votes. You know, you win those three, the fat lady sings. Those three, 70 votes. I always say every four years, if somebody wins Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, it's over. Mathematically, you can win the other three states out west with 19, but it's, it's over. You can swing maybe North Carolina or Virginia. Maybe you can swing Missouri, or maybe the Republicans can swing New Hampshire with four or whatever. But it's irrelevant with 70 votes. A lot of analysts are now saying advantage Hillary. Why? Obama swept all three of the big eastern swings in 08 and 12. So here's what you see. All the red states went red in 08 and 12, and all the blue states went blue, but Obama went six for six with the purple states. The Republicans cannot lose all six in, in 16. They've got to win theoretically half of them, or the, at least two of the bigs. Right, everybody? Some analysts are saying, now hold on, advantage Trump. Here's why. Um, especially in Florida, but also in Ohio and Pennsylvania, it's a little harder to register to vote and to vote, which could keep thousands of Democrats from registering and voting. Uh, and that couple thousand votes in a 50-50 race, and we all think Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio are going to be nail biters, that could be the deciding factor. The most important state, of course, is Florida. Florida is the national bellwether. Uh, the person that has won Florida from 1960 until today has gone on to be president every single time but one. From 1924 until today, every single time but two. And with 29 electoral votes, that's big. That's big. You'd have to win three mid-sized states to counter one Florida, or six small states, and that's not going to happen. Florida is also important for the following reason. Keep your eyes on Florida. This bodes well for both Trump and Hillary because they both won Florida big. So people were saying, if it was Trump against Bernie, advantage Trump. If it was Hillary against someone else, advantage Hillary. But Florida has every major demographic group in big numbers. Florida has a large uh, black population, a large Latino population, a large gay population, a large Jewish population, uh, the largest veterans population in the country. We also, I'm not sure, but my guess is we have a large senior population. I'm not sure, but I'll get back to you on that one. Um, so what you do is you look at those demographics in key swing states. For example, don't look at Idaho, anyone. It doesn't matter. What you look at is the Latino vote in Colorado, or the women's vote in Ohio, or the turnout in Florida. Those are the things that are going to decide this race. Uh, let me end by talking about, Brian asked me to share where Trump and Hillary are on um, Israel. Uh, so I looked up quotes, records, and so forth, and here we go. I'll start with Hillary, because that's easy to do, because she was Secretary of State for four years, and she spent eight years in the Senate, so she has a voting record on Israel. I encourage all of you to go to sources like PolitiFact, uh, Vote Smart and other sources online which track voting. Um, those of you that know me know that I always say this. I believe, and I said it four years ago, Brian, when I was here, that I believe firmly that both parties are good for Israel. I have never liked it when Democrats say Republicans aren't good for Israel and when Republicans say Democrats aren't good for Israel. From my buddy Harry Truman on, both parties have been excellent for Israel. Uh, Massive loan guarantees, massive aid packages, great trade agreements. Just about everything Israel has asked for, for seven decades, Israel gets from us with bipartisan support. If you look, for example, at funding for the Iron Dome, the short-range uh, anti-missile system from, what, about three, four miles out to 40 miles out. If you look at uh, David's uh, sling, which is the mid-range system they're developing. And if you look at the Arrow, which is the long-range, the anti-ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System, when the US provides funding, it goes through Congress like that 
with 98, 99% vote. Name me something else that flies through Congress with almost 100% bipartisan support. Nothing. Presidents of both parties sign these kind of things before the ink is even dry. Um, so both parties have been excellent for Israel. Hillary's voting record in the eight years that she was in the Senate on pro-Israel measures is 100%. She has never voted against anything in support of Israel. Here's some examples. Uh, I've done a lot of fundraisers from Agon to Vita Dome, but as you know, the International Red Cross and the American Red Cross were hesitant about recognizing the legitimacy of MDA, right? Hillary was one of the leaders to get them to recognize Agon to Vita Dome. Israel, Hillary has visited Israel many, many, many times. Her first visit was New Year's Day, 1982. So she's been in Israel a lot. Um, as First Lady of Arkansas, she pushed uh, curriculum in the state on Israel and against anti-Semitic nonsense. She's defended Israel in the United Nations when the UN, as you all know well, every year there are countless measures in the UN that try to condemn Israel for this or that or this or that. But because the US is in the Security Council, we can veto. Uh, Hillary was a leader in pushing vetoes and pushing back on criticisms of Israel. Hillary has always voted for uh, loan guarantees for Israel in the $3 billion per year range, massive military aid, trade agreements, joint commercial uh, intel sharing, uh, intelligence sharing, et cetera. She was one of the prime architects on the Iran sanctions. Okay, which everybody, I think, agreed. She does support the uh, uh, Iran nuclear deal, which I know a lot of people don't support. Um, uh, she supported Israel's right to build a security barrier when very few other people around the world did. Um, she was a, a vote in Congress for pushing for the release of IDF prisoners. Uh, also a Secretary of State, she intervened to try to get uh, Israeli soldiers freed, those held by Hamas. Hezbollah, so forth. She was one of the co-sponsors of the Palestine Anti-Terror Act, uh, which stopped aid to Hamas and terrorist organizations. She was also a co-sponsor of an, a legislation to study the connections between Syria and terrorism and bring that to the UN's attention. She's worked with the Palestinian Media Watch organization. If anybody's followed, look it up, Palestinian Media Watch. They monitor uh, curriculum in the West Bank that's bitterly anti-Israel or anti-Semitic. When there's curriculum in schools that denies Israel's legitimacy, they publish this. So she's been a big supporter of them. Uh, in 2011, when the United Nations was trying to unilaterally declare statehood for Palestine without Israel's input, she led the veto on that. Uh, when there were efforts in 2010 and 2011 to impose international sanctions against Israel, she led the veto against those. Here's one that I always thought was interesting. In 2011, she made another visit to Israel to meet with Bibi. And on the eve of the visit, he announced massive subsidies for more settlements, which was a blatant slap in her face designed to embarrass her during the visit. She was gracious never mentioned the settlements, and talked about our close friendship and alliance. That had to be very difficult. Uh, so despite him poking her in the eye, she stood solidly uh, where we hope she is. She endorsed, do you remember Ariel Sharon's convergence plan, which talked about Israel keeping or having rights to some of the territories that Israel gained in the 67 war? She supported that. Do you remember the Goldstone Report? That was very critical, of course, of Palestinians, but of both Israel as well, for human rights violations. But it held Israel to an impossibly high standard, but forgave the Palestinians of a rather low bar. Hillary was very critical of the Goldstone Report, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Trump, this is difficult. He's not been in public life, so we don't have a voting record. We have his comments. Uh, now, Trump has had very... Uh, positive comments about his support for Israel. Quote, unquote, Israel is our best friend. Quote, unquote, uh, Israel should be the cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. 
quote unquote, Israel is the only stable democracy in a region that is run by dictators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Trump has repeatedly said that. He said one of the first things he would do as president is invite Bibi for a meeting. Trump taped a 30 second video endorsing Netanyahu during the last uh, campaign. So his comments have been staunchly pro-Israel. However, when he's been asked to give specific examples of ways that he would support Israel, he's repeatedly said three things. My daughter married a Jew. I was once the Grand Marshal in a Jewish parade in New York, and I have Jewish attorneys. Um, now, that's all good, but I need specifics on two-state solutions, on dealing with ISIS, and so forth and so on. Some people have applauded Trump for this personally, and I'm not trying to offend anyone, uh, and I'm not speaking for Brian or anyone else, just myself, but uh, Trump's Middle East advisor is Jason Greenblatt, who's uh, uh, an orthodox real estate attorney. Now, I want someone with PhDs in Middle East studies as my Middle East advisor, not a real estate attorney. Um, he is Jewish, but most people have a Middle East advisor who is Jewish. Um, so I'm not so sure. Here's one concern. Trump has made some pretty uh, insulting comments about John McCain being a POW. Um, there's probably no issue that's more sensitive to Israelis who have lost soldiers to being prisoners of war than trying to get back prisoners of war and someone who says he doesn't like people that are captured, he prefers those that aren't and wouldn't negotiate for the release. That's com controversial. Uh, Trump spoke to the Republican Jewish Coalition and he said something to them that, uh, you've, you let me know where you are on it. He said, uh, you all probably won't support me because I don't want your contributions. I think it plays into that stereotype of Jews are all rich who fund elections. Um, I don't know, personally I thought that was troublesome. You decide. Um, he was supposed to finally visit Israel on December 28th, but he had to cancel it because he made that comment uh, that Muslims are not allowed in the US. 37 members of the Knesset and others were gonna boycott it, so he probably wisely canceled his, his visit. Um, Another potential concern is um, Trump's understanding of foreign policy. Um, he mixed up the Cuds and the Kurds. Um, the Kurdish Peshmerga are our our allies in the region. The Cuds are a bad Iranian military unit, so that's not so good. When he was criticizing Obama's position on ISIS, he was asked what he would do about uh, Baghdadi, and he didn't know who Baghdadi was. He's the head of ISIS. Um, he said he would not have a problem if more nations got nuclear weapons. The single issue that keeps me up the most at night is a nuke in Iran. Um, he was asked about the nuclear triad and deterrence theory, which were the cornerstone of American nuclear deterrence from the testing of the atomic bomb until today, and he had never heard of either one of them. He said we should get out of NATO. He said that he would be neutral when dealing with Israel on the Palestinian question. He said he would pr approach negotiations with Israel and Palestine with a clean slate. There is no clean slate. There is an undeniable thousands of year long history that positions us squarely with Israel. When he was asked for how he would deal with Israel on the Palestinian question, he said, you can find all the answers in my book, The Art of the Deal. That, this is not a real estate negotiation. It's not a real estate negotiation. His surprise in negotiating for Israel, he said his technique, his advantage for negotiating would be, quote unquote, surprise and unpredictability. We don't need unpredictability when it comes to Israel's future. In his APAC speech, he said some things which were very encouraging, uh, but he also contradicted himself. He said that uh, he would dismantle the Iran deal within the first five minutes of being president, which APAC applauded. I personally am opposed to that, and I know a lot of 
you would disagree with me. But then he turned around and said that he would do everything he could to enforce the Iran, Iran Treaty. Um, and of course, it goes on and on and on. He said that he admired Putin and Le Pen. I don't think either one is a friend of Israel. And when he was asked about David Duke, um, he sidestepped uh, the issue. So I believe that everyone who ran for president, with the exception of Rand Paul, I think both parties would have been solid for Israel. Trump's rhetoric has positioned him as someone who would be great for Israel. I just don't know the particulars beyond that. Uh, but I would almost say this. Uh, the bigger question is this. Support for Israel has become institutionalized in America, whether it's APAC or the ADL or Siegel College or uh, people like Chuck Schumer in the Congress or when, Carl, when Levin was in the Senate, uh, whether it's uh, by broad bipartisan support in, in, in both chambers of Congress. Support for Israel is so strong that even if someone like Rand Paul or Dennis Kucinich was president, we would probably continue to fund the Iron Dome. OK, everyone? Thank you. <laughs> Brian, I may never be invited back. <laughs> Questions, anything you want to talk about? And we have microphones going around the audience. Anything about the campaign or any? There's one in the back uh, there. and. One in the middle. Brian is one here in the middle, and then this gentleman in the back. And if you can't hear it, I'll repeat the question. Thank you. I have a question for you about Mr. Trump. He's campaigning in his own inimitable style for the position in the Republican Party. Is he really going to campaign for the presidency, or is this just a game that he will win because he wins games? Huh? Did you all hear that? Yeah. So um, I would say Trump's campaign has become the latest reality TV show. It really has all the tenets of it. Jeb's was not. Kasich's was not. Uh, it was too dull, right? Um, too responsible. Um, but Trump's campaign has really become, in many ways, a reality TV show to the point where if it wasn't for the presidency, and I know some Trump supporters are going to be angry with me, but it's hard to take a lot of what he says seriously when it's that flippant. Um, but I would say the same thing about Bernie. I think Bernie has been very irresponsible uh, because neither man will compromise. Both, man, both men attack their opponents. Anyone that disagrees with them is wrong. Uh, my gosh, I would never say such a thing. I don't know. Um, our Constitution was built on the foundation of compromise, consensus, cooperation. Think about it. The genius of the framers was that to prevent someone from running off willy-nilly and governing with emotion, and she never governs wisely. We want to govern with prudence in a cautious manner. The framers pitted the president against the Congress, the House against the Senate, the courts against everyone, the feds against the states. The Constitution is an invitation to struggle. It creates conflict by design, on purpose, so that the only way to move forward is to use the building blocks of our democracy, the three C's, compromise, cooperation, and consensus, to move forward. When you have multiple members of Congress thumping their chest and pledging that they would never, ever, ever compromise, and that's a good thing, it worries me. It worries me when you have candidates on both sides of the aisle running for the highest office pledging that they would never compromise. George Washington compromised. Lincoln, Truman, they all did. Reagan. Thank Reagan changed his mind on Reykjavik and nuclear detente. Thank God. So did Nixon. Thank God they both saved the world, right? Uh, Lincoln flipped on his, his generals uh, running the war, and he finally found one that would win. George Washington flip-flopped and compromised on his strategy for the revolution. And if he did not, we would all be drinking tea today. Um, so it worries me. Um, it also worries me that 
we should never take the low road to the highest office in the land. Um, I'm a big Lincoln fan, and Lincoln always said that one of the main jobs of the president is to appeal to our better angels. We need to lift the country up. We need to lift them up. We always need to appeal to the better angels, not appeal to fear and anger, which I believe Trump and Bernie have both done, uh, and so many other candidates of both political parties, um, which I think is problematic. Uh, sir? Even though um, Bernie Sanders is not probably going to be a candidate for president, uh, his presence on the election trail has been a major factor in the last Absolutely. several months. Absolutely. Would you please comment on his effect on the Democratic platform and his effect on Hillary Clinton pulling farther to the left? Good questions. I, I don't think Bernie ever thought he would get this far. Bernie Sanders has shocked everyone. He's accomplished probably far more than he ever had hoped to accomplish. He's affected the political debate. He's brought hundreds of thousands of people into the process. He's dominated media coverage. It's been extraordinary. He's been toe-to-toe, dollar-for-dollar -to -dollar fundraising with a Clinton. That's remarkable. Uh, so he's, his campaign's been extraordinary. Early on, I'm singing a different tune now. Early on, I said that Bernie would help Hillary. Because as you know, Hillary was running in the middle. She really moderated her positions, which was smart. You win the presidency by being in the middle. In 1988, when Dukakis, with folks like Jesse Jackson and Babbitt and Songus running, the Democrats drifted too far to the left, which allowed Bush one to claim the center and win, obviously. Um, in 2012, Mitt Romney, I think, was a darn good candidate, but with Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and Rick Santorum, the Republicans drifted too far to the right, making it difficult for Mitt to then tack back to the center. The only, so I think he was going to help Hillary because Hillary was in the middle. The only problem with being in the middle early is you might not energize your base. Bernie was energizing the left-wing base, but yet Hillary was in the middle. She could have her cake and eat it. However, he energized them more than she could have thought, which forced her to go left. Now she has to tack back to the middle. I think if you had an Eisenhower, a Dole, uh, a Ford, a McCain, a Nixon, uh, Another Republican running, Hillary could be in serious trouble because they would have claimed the middle. Bush won. And she has had to drift to the left because of Bernie. And Bernie's staying in it to the end. I mean, he's going to be hanging onto the doors as they drag him out, right? Um, so, and he's not going to go out nice. Um, he's going out with a punch. So uh, Hillary's going to have to tack back to the middle, which is difficult to do. Can she do it? Well, Trump is so far to the right that the middle's still wide open. But I think the Republicans missed an opportunity with someone like a Jeb. Uh, it's wide open. I also he said about a year ago that anyone that knew Bernie and followed Bernie's career, Bernie was always a gentleman. He would get feisty when it came to increasing minimum wage or the excesses of the health insurance industry, but he was never personally nasty. Now he's just angry. Um, he's angry. He attacks the media. He attacks people that don't support him. His supporters attack people. He attacks his colleagues in the Senate. If you look at it, Patrick Leahy, Howard Dean, leading liberal Democrats from his own state don't even like him. Um, it's difficult. So Bernie has gotten, he, he's not the Bernie that he was for the last 20 some years. So now I think he's hurting Hillary. Okay, who else? There's another one in the middle, there's two over here, and one up front. If, if there were a, a moderate Republican, like in the, in the likes of, I'm sorry. If there were a moderate Republican like uh, Clifford Case, to J uh, Jacob Javits, couldn't they easily beat, uh, win the election, if there were a moderate Republican? If there were a moderate Republican, could they easily win the election? Now, first off, as I said a moment ago, I think the biggest advantage the Dems have is demographics. And the demographics, the numbers just aren't there for the Republicans. If the turnout in 2016 is the same turnout as it was in 2008, the Democrats win comfortably because there's more Latinos, more women voting. 
if the turnout is what it was in 2012, the Democrats win comfortably because the demographics are as they are. The Republicans have to hope for low turnout. The only way they can win, I believe, is one, low turnout by the Democrats, two, a colossal misstep by Hillary, some indictment, some who knows what, or three, maybe major terror attacks in the U.S. which scares people. Um, now, if they had had a moderate Republican running all along, I think they could have potentially siphoned off some Latino votes, some women's vote. Let's say a moderate Republican woman. If she had been running with the vision that, let's say, Jeb had, where Jeb was working hard to get the Latino vote, I think it would have been winnable because Hillary is simply not popular. If Bill was running, I think it would be over. No, I do. Because the Democrats would have their turnout. And, it, and with Hillary, I don't know if they're going to have their turnout. But the Republicans missed a golden opportunity this time around, I think. So since we're in the home state of Roger Ailes, okay. uh, to what extent has Fox News over the last decade or more delegitimized Hillary as a oh. candidate? Fox News has been the elephant in the room. Fox News is incredibly important, incredibly powerful. Uh, there have been a number of polls. Uh, I've given a couple lectures on this down in Florida where it's a pretty dull lecture like this one, where I just go through and I show a lot of numbers. Scholars have done polling. It's fascinating. They asked the public, was Saddam Hussein behind 9-11? And they asked the American public, but then they asked them, where do they get their news? And like 1% of NPR, PBS viewers think Saddam Hussein was behind it. Like 20% of ABC, CBS, NBC, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Cleveland Plains Dealer, uh, et cetera, the Miami Herald. But like 80% of Fox viewers believe that Saddam Hussein was behind it. But if you watch Fox's coverage, I've done lots of Fox interviews. I'm actually the political analyst for Fox 29, also in South Florida, NBC5 and Fox 29. Um, I've done multiple Fox interviews where I'm sitting in the green room, where I got the earpiece in, and I'm waiting. Uh, let's say March of 03, when we were liberating or invading uh, Iraq. And the reporter would be, the anchor would be saying something like, uh, the U.S. is facing a difficult situation, but, you know, because Saddam Hussein hit us on the we need to, blah, blah. And I would go, what? <laughs> because Saddam Hussein hit us on 9-11. So there's a lot of that stuff put in there, like MSNBC does on the left. Um, it's just that no one watches MSNBC. Um, so Fox has, look at the numbers, look at the numbers. Um, so Fox is very, very influential. Fox has gone after Hillary Clinton on a weekly basis since it was founded. So um, now, has Hillary made mistakes? Of course. Has Hillary had missteps? Of course. Um, but here's what you find. Um, I think Benghazi was a disaster. But we have, had, we have an entire committee of Congress whose sole mission is it is to investigate her in Benghazi. We have an, do you know that? We have an entire funded full committee. I want to get to the bottom of Benghazi, but we shouldn't have complete committees just for, you know. We've had more hearings on her email than we did on Iran-Contra or Watergate put together. We should have hearings on all of them. Uh, and what Fox does is they cover this every day. When after the 30th hearing, NBC just stopped covering it. The Wall Street Journal just stopped covering it. And the New York Times, after the 53rd hearing, when nothing was found, they just stopped covering it. Fox still covers it. So they're very, very influential. Look at their numbers. They're crushing MSNBC. Again, no one watches it. So, uh, or Yes, hi. I have a number of female friends who are married to elderly, white-haired men who actually may hey, be in this hey, room. Hey, hey, be careful now. Who may be in this room at the moment. Um, who have validated Trump's uh, position on Israel by saying that he's one of the largest monetary donors to the state of Israel. Do you find any proof that that exists? No, he's not. Thank you. Sheldon Adelson is a huge monetary. Sheldon Adelson owns a newspaper in Israel. He's funded um, uh, uh, child care facilities, all sorts of things uh, there. Sheldon Adelson's been a, been a big donor. Sheldon Adelson and Trump are doing the, the courtship dance right now. 
It was Adelson who was organizing Trump's visit to Israel, a planned visit to Israel in December. Sheldon Adelson organized Mitt Romney's visit to Israel back in 2012. So that's an important role. I do think candidates, I don't think you need to go to Israel. For example, Harry Truman never went to Israel, and his positions on Israel were the greatest of any president in history, probably forever. Uh, a lot of Republicans like Reagan and thought Reagan was great for Israel. Reagan never went to Israel. So I don't think it's an absolute must, but I do think it's important. Um, so maybe that's where the link is. Adelson gives a lot, but Adelson was tied into that. So, uh, but Trump's comments on Israel have been very muscular. I would stand, it's my number one priority. Yeah. Who else? There's one way in the back. <laughs> Do you have any um, projections uh, of who might be Hillary's vice presidential candidate? Yeah, or predictions, any advice? projections. If the election were today, I think it would be a nail biter, but Hillary would win. If the Senate race was today, I think the Dems could take the Senate back by one, maybe two seats. All that depends on Democrats. If turnout is normal, Hillary wins the presidency, Dems take back the Senate by one or two seats if turnout is normal. Hillary's VP, uh, there's a not so short, short list um, with Ohio politicians, with uh, both Kane and Warner from Virginia are on it. Um, Julian, Julian Castro is on top of everyone's list uh, for her. He's young, he's handsome, he's smart, he has no scandals, he's kind of humble and all shucks. He's not, you know, he seems to be made in one of those Disney animatron studios somewhere <laughs> when we used to make great can. I don't know. So um, Julian Castro is atop the list. Other interesting picks, Elizabeth Warren is on the short list because she would bring in the Bernie supporters, theoretically. Um, the other question is, would all these folks want to be VP for either Hillary or Donald Trump? Um, Castro gets along with the Clintons very well, so presumably he would say yes. And they've been courting one another for months now, so. All right. Thank you, Robert, so much for joining us. Thank you.